<laughs> Continuing our journey through the book of Romans. Let's turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Last week we used verse 1 of chapter 2 as a springboard to talk about um, judging. We looked at chapter 2 in verse 1, and we read that, and I'll read it again for you quickly. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for what in, in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. And we talked about how um, that sounds very familiar with Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's something that uh, people in the world especially, uh, or people who call themselves Christians but live how they want to, they love Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. They can't quote you chapter and verse or the address of it, but they can tell you, judge not that ye be not judged. Your Jesus said, your Bible says, that you can't say anything about the way that I I'm living my life or doing things. Well, I want you to understand they're right and they're wrong. They're, they're right if they are non-believers. Paul says, don't judge those who are outside of the church, but if they are in the church and they call themselves a Christian, then you're supposed to deal with them like you would your brother or your sister even in the flesh. Now, if my brother, I mean, Justin here, regardless of the fact that we're Christians, if he was being ugly, and I've had to do this back before he served the Lord, come and talk to him about it. And, and, you know, and, and he would do the same for me. That's what you do in a family, right? Well, you know, if they're, if they're not doing the right thing, if you think they'll hear from you. Now, sometimes people are just refusing to do the right thing, and they go down a path, and, and you've got to let them go. It's like the prodigal son. You, you let them go. But if people call themselves believers... And they consider themselves a Christian. The Bible says that we ought to approach them about things. And so when you read Matthew chapter 7 and you read it in its content, um, Jesus says that if you're guilty, don't be going and telling other people they got an issue they need to deal with. But he does say this. He says, first, remove your guilt. He says, take the beam out of your eye, then go to your brother. So what is the conclusion there? The conclusion isn't that we're not supposed to approach each other about sin. The conclusion is get your life right and then with love go and try and restore others. That's the proper perspective. And we used verse 1 as a springboard uh, to cover a lot of verses around that topic. And uh, we just realized that, that, that uh, we need to be careful about how we approach one another. Now that's important because... There's not a person in this room who don't need to hear this this morning. Because each and every one of us feel like we got something else that, that, that we need to deal with somebody other than us about. I mean, whether we say it or whether we do it or not, we observe one another and say, oh, that person needs to blah, 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 you fill in the blank. All of us do that. All of us feel like we can look at somebody, we can probably, right now, if we were honest, we could think of ourselves, who do we know that really needs to change some things in their life. People specifically that we say, these people are Christians, or at least call themselves Christians, they need to get some things right in their life. We fill this out. Well, what the Lord is saying, hey, be careful. That's what the Lord is saying, be careful. Now, it doesn't say that we shouldn't approach them. It's just we approach them with righteous judgment. So when we read in verse 1, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. That's unrighteous judgment. If I'm talking to Cody about something that's in his life, I tell him, Cody, you spend way too much time watching football. Well, I better be careful. because <laughs> Y'all know I love watching football. But that would be unrighteous judgment. But... In verse 2, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. What is it about the righteous judgment of God? Is that He is righteous and He is blameless. He doesn't have to remove the beam from His eye. He is holy, He is blameless, and He has righteous judgment, meaning I am pure and I'm coming to remove something from your eye. 
and the righteousness of God. That's the judgment that we need to be looking for, is the righteous judgment of God. We need to be inviting and accepting God's righteous judgment in our lives, even if he wants to bring it into our lives through a brother or a sister, or maybe directly in our Bible study or in our prayer. But we need to be seeking righteous judgment from God. And we continue in verse 3. And Paul says this, And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? This is something I want us to keep in mind, is I absolutely believe in the infallibility of the Scriptures. I absolutely believe in the divine inspiration of the Scriptures. I also absolutely believe that the writings are not absence of their writer as far as the one who is actually doing the speaking like here is Paul. Paul has his fingerprints all over his writings. He has some unique approaches. Well, it's, it's at least different than some of the other apostles who have written. And here is one of the things that you will find very common in Paul's writings. It's a parenthetical statement, okay? I'm not an educated man, but I know what a what parentheses are and and a a parenthetical statement is that you have a topic it's something that you say but either before in the middle or after you have something more specific about that particular topic that is just part of dialogue now, although when you look in the Greek manuscripts, they don't have parentheses, they don't have quotations, they don't have punctuation, um, a parenthetical statement did exist back in those days. It's always existed. It's, it's something that we always say and we do. Matter of fact, we make parenthetical statements, whether we know it or not, on a daily basis. You see what I did right there? Yeah, Joe did. We make parenthetical statements whether we know it or not, on a daily basis. See, the statement is, we make parenthetical statements on a daily basis. That's the statement. The parenthetical statement is whether we know it or not. That's something that just drills down. And I want us to keep that in mind because we're going to come into that a lot with Paul. Paul does that a lot. So in a parenthetical statement, you could make the statement without that uh, parentheses part and just say and do you think this old man that you will escape the judgment of God do you really think you're going to escape the judgment of God but the drilling down a little bit further is you who practice these very things well do we practice these things what are these things we read through these things in, in chapter 1 Romans chapter 1 and Paul gives this long list of really ugly things that people do there, he talks about uh, sexual immorality, he talks about murder, he talks about lying, he talks about gossiping, he talks about all these things, he talks about withholding love from one another, he talks about all these horrible things, and he gives this really, really, really long list. And this is what I want us to hear this morning really quickly, is that what we have a problem doing is we as Christians, we have this 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 uncontrollable desire, it is controllable, I'm being a little bit facetious, something Paul does also, is this uncontrollable desire to go and treat symptoms. Now, when we get sick, we have a desire for the truth. And what I mean is that we don't want a doctor to just treat the symptoms. We want a doctor to find the cure. I want you to know that everything that Paul listed are symptoms of a sin disease. It's a disease that infects all of us. The disease, regardless of its symptoms, that might be murder, that might be homosexuality, that might be fornication of various types, that might be um, just hatred, that might just be angry without cause, without, without just be gossiping, all these things that we put on different levels. Some of these things we are okay with being in our lives and we're still somewhat of a good Christian we're okay, but we, as long as we don't do these bigger ones, you are treating symptoms. You are looking at sin as if the symptoms are the problem. No, the symptoms are signs of the problem. They're what Paul calls works of the flesh. They're the opposite of fruit of the Spirit. The symptoms of walking in the Lord are loving, kindness, gentleness, meekness. These are the things that spring forth. They're not the things that prove that you are a Christian as far as these things make you a Christian. No, they're a result of what's going on inside. Like these symptoms are the result of what's going on inside. 
That's where we need to get a reality check this morning because what we have a tendency to do is look around at other people's symptoms and see how bad off they are. Well, you know what? (laughs) The symptoms that we show are the symptoms of the same disease. And if we looked at it like that, we might be a little more careful and, and, and receive what Paul, what the Lord has to say about our judging one another. Are we guilty? Because Paul says we are guilty. Well, remember what we read, and you don't have to turn there, but for the sake of time, we'll just kind of go through this quickly, but he'll put the verses up there. You remember in this this Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said these things here. Because what we want to do is we want to say, hey, that guy is a murderer, or that guy is a fornicator, but I, I'm, 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 I'm a gossiper. I may do this, that, or the other. But, but I'm not like, like they are. But this is what Jesus says. He says, I don't look at it like that. In Matthew chapter 5, he starts breaking things down to him. And he says this in verse 21. He says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, that's not right. Go to verse 21. You have heard that, it's, that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. Every one of us good Christian folks are here and say, Amen, that's right. We just we better not be going and murdering people. But Jesus says this. Now, what do we see? They're in danger of what? It says in verse 21, And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. He said, these two different things, being angry with your brother without cause or killing him has the same result. They're both symptoms of the same problem. And it's the cure that we need, because neither one of them are love for your brother. And we talked about that in James chapter 2, where James said, this royal law, love your brother as yourself. He says, if you do that, you do well. Because I don't have to worry about, don't kill my brother, don't steal from my brother, don't sleep with his wife. All i gotta do, all I got to do is just love him. If I love him, I'll automatically take care of all those things. And Jesus is saying, this is the problem. And we are oftentimes call ourselves Christians. We're very, very unloving people. We are angry with one another too often without cause. Sometimes there is a cause to be angry with someone who's doing something wrong. But you be angry and you sin not. There's a righteous judgment. There's a righteous anger. But we, how many times are we really righteously angry with somebody? We are just, we're sometimes just in the flesh. You're not loving, not patient, not kind. We're not like Christ. We have a disease. Verse 27 of that very same chapter in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says this. Where did Matthew go? Here he is. 27. Verse 27. You have heard it was said of, to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. And all the church said, Amen. Don't you commit adultery. That's a bad thing. You don't commit adultery. And Jesus said, But I say to you that whosoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He says, it's the same thing. You're looking at two different acts. They're two different behaviors. They have the same result and they're the same root cause. And the Lord is not confused by the two. And those of us that don't actually commit adultery, but commit adultery in our hearts, you think that the Lord is looking at us any differently, the one who's actually uh, acting it out? We look at each other differently. How convenient it is that we would look at each other differently. And as we see last week, it's so much easier to see the sin in other people's lives than it is to see the sin in our lives. So the reality is, is that if we were to be honest, we would probably find that the finger is pointing at us. The, the title of this series, as we're going through this book of Romans, we've titled it, transformed and we've got that from romans chapter 12 and verse 2 be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind we are looking expecting desiring for god to transform our minds and this is the problem okay i'm going to get your attention again wake back up for a moment this is what you need to hear this morning is that we have a tendency those of us that have come into uh, salvation we've been saved 
See, we can admit that we used to be bad. We can admit that we used to be ugly. We can admit that we used to do bad things. But it's so too often that we can admit that that's the way we used to be. But when we sometimes have uh, uh, acts of, of, of falling back to our old ways, we don't like to admit that we are presently in a bad situation, that we are presently being bad. It's easier because we can displace the blame. It's like, oh, that's who I was. Past tense, meaning I don't have to presently be accountable for that. But I'm going to tell you something. I am constantly having to be presently accountable before God. I, I, I don't know that it, maybe I'm just the worst of all, and I feel like I'm the chiefest of sinners, as Paul said. I said, man, I don't know about you, but this is, this is true for me. I have to constantly get before the Lord and say, Lord, I know I'm messed up. I am. Steve is a bad person. And my flesh did not get saved with me. Steve's flesh did not go to the altar and say, Lord, forgive me. Steve's flesh went to the altar leaving claw marks in the ground because the flesh doesn't want to please God. And the flesh still doesn't want to please God. Whether you want to admit it or not, your flesh does not want to please God. And all you got to do to get and be the ugliest thing that you've ever thought you could possibly do is just begin to put God on the back burner. The other day, Clinton and I were talking about this very thing, and we discussed how people don't accidentally sin. I told him, I said, I have never been on Bible Hub on my computer, researching some Bible verses, and opened a new tab for porn. No, it's never happened. You know why? Because when I'm pursuing God, I can't, when I'm walking in the Spirit, I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. The reality is, is that when I'm pursuing God, I'm, I'm in study, I'm in prayer, I'm in service. Now, that's something that a lot of people don't want here. They go, I go to church, I study, and I read my Bible, and I pray. Are you service and serving in the body? If I'm doing all these things, then I find that my flesh is just becoming weak and can't rule over me. But whenever I let those things go... I let my prayer life go. I let my Bible study go. I let these things, you know what? I start looking and allowing other things to come in and influence my life. And the next thing you know, well, maybe I could go and search something on the internet I ain't supposed to. Maybe I could go and do some of these other things. Well, I praise the Lord that He has made a big change in my heart. I don't find myself doing those things. Instead, I like going, I got four Bible Hub windows on my computer right now. I'm not declaring my own righteousness. I'm declaring that God makes a difference in a dirty, rotten scoundrel like me. He can do it for you if you would admit that you need it done. Maybe I'm the only one. But we need to understand that. But we abuse God's long-sufferingness. We know in 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. This is Paul, uh, Peter. He's writing, and he's dealing with the church that would be hearing from the world say, hey, you know, 2,000 years ago, you know, you go by, you know, a few decades go by, I thought, I thought your Jesus was coming back. I thought y'all were going to get raptured. I thought, you know, I thought all this kind of stuff. That's what was happening to the people in the church. And Peter's dealing with that. And he says, he says, he says, don't count God as if he don't fulfill his promises. He's just long suffering because he's not willing that any should perish. Meaning he just, he's just long suffering. He wants everybody to be saved, but don't be confused. It doesn't mean everybody will be saved. His own words declare that not everyone will be saved, but he is very long-suffering. He is very patient. He is very merciful, our God is. And so we take that too often to mean that God's wrath is not upon me. His judgment has come not come down on me for the things that I'm doing in my life. It must be all right. God really don't have an issue with that. Well, Paul saw that one coming. So he deals with it here in verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering? That's all him just waiting and not re pouring out his 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 wrath of destruction on you. He says, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Okay, now let's read that again. Let's read that because it's a little deep here. We're gonna have to go a little deeper on this. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness? He said, or. He's hinging this off this other thing that he said about how you're guilty and you're judging people. 
He says, do you think that God is not going to... He says, will you escape the judgment of God in the previous verse? Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? He's saying this. Do you think that you're escaping and that you are going to be free from the wrath of God to come because He's not poured out His wrath in the way that you would think it would be poured out now? And that leads me to this. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the wrath of God is being displayed, revealed. Paul said that in chapter 1. Now he talks about a wrath to come. There's a wrath of God that is being revealed right now. And if you don't think it's not being revealed, all you got to do is get on the internet or look around town and you will see all the ugliness that is mankind. People that God have said, hey, have your way. One of the worst things that we talked, we talked about this. One of the worst things that we can see as far as God's anger is God saying, I'm done with you. Now, it doesn't mean that God's saying, I'm forever done with you. Some people think that's what it says there. I don't believe that at all. He's just saying, I am giving you your way. And boy, when God does that, all that is evil comes in that person's life and they begin to act it out and those people act it out. And that's what is described in Romans chapter 1. That is a wrath of God that we see presently, and it's a horrible thing. But there's a wrath that is to come also. Because, don't kid yourself, God will reveal His wrath and His judgment. But He's waiting, and that's where people say, well, God's not doing anything about what I'm doing now, so God must be okay with it. Well, that's not what the Scripture says. Matter of fact, Paul's saying that's His mercy, that's His long-sufferingness. It's there to bring you to repentance. Now, wait a second. Wouldn't it be a better approach, God? Okay, I'm being sarcastic here, okay? Wouldn't it be a better approach, God, that if somebody is doing something wrong in their life, that you just immediately make them pay for it? I mean, it's like, it's like oh man, if I'm going to go and do this thing over here, it's wrong immediately. Uh, uh, my car breaks down immediately. Sometimes he will do that, but a lot of times he doesn't. He lets you go and do your things. And he's still oftentimes good to you. What? That guy who's doing horrible bad things got a raise at work? I didn't get a raise. What is going on with God? Does he not know how to do this thing? You know, how many times have we seen that and we've wondered? Well, a lot of times, God's long-suffering and goodness even is meant to bring you to repentance. Here's something very familiar uh, uh, to, uh, well, it's, it's similar. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says this. So if you want to just jump ahead, Paul, we're going we're gonna to be here eventually. But Romans chapter 12, Paul says this very odd statement. And, and uh, I've heard it. <laughs> taken out of context too many times. But Romans chapter 12, Paul is writing about people who are ugly to us. And uh, we're going to use this as an example uh, as God, as he is enduring people who are ugly to him. And so Romans chapter 12, and let's look at this verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's that verse 20 that Paul is actually quoting uh, from Proverbs. And <laughs> it's the proverb that says, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. If your enemy is doing you wrong, then let's get some coals on their head. Heaping coals of fire on their head. That's the way to get them back, right? Is that what you think it's saying? No, it's just actually just the opposite. It's saying you do good to those who are doing bad to you. Because it won't work all the time, meaning not everybody will repent of it, but oftentimes people will repent whenever you, especially we'll use you as an example, when somebody is being ugly to you and you return good to them, sometimes the, the guilt and shame they experience, expecting that they would get a different result from you, immediately pours guilt and shame on them. And then these, these are the coals of the Lord. And hopefully that they would repent and say, oh my goodness, that was really wrong of me. You know, the best chances you have 
of somebody realizing that they are being ugly to you is for you to be loving back to them. And because it's, it, it can actually can make them feel stupid or, or, or like an idiot, like, oh my gosh, I'm being mean to this person who's nice to me. If they have a heart of repentance, they will oftentimes repent. But some people don't have a heart of repentance. Some people will say, you know what? That means I can continue to get away with it. And that's what some people do to God. And that's why Paul is saying, is that what you think's happening here? Because God is continuing to do good for you. God is continuing to bless you. That means he's okay with what's going on in your life. No, he's being good of you, hoping that you will sort of turn around and say, oh my gosh, look at all the blessings in my life. I can't believe I've been disregarding God. That has happened in my life. That has happened in my relationship with him, where I have really not made him a priority. I've kind of put him on the back burner and maybe got focused on other things. And then all of a sudden, he blesses me in such a way that I was like, oh my God, it's this clearly from the Lord, a blessing. And I'm like, I'm so undeserving of that. So undeserving of that. And it brings me to repentance. You see, it? that's what Paul, this is what, this is what we're supposed to be learning, people. That's what Paul is trying to tell us right here. He says, God has been patient with you. Don't think that because God has not poured out a wrath that you can see right now and that you're still blessed in your surrounding, that he is okay with the way that you're living your life. He's trying to bring you to repentance. You think you're innocent because you don't see wrath. No, you're not innocent. But he is limited in his long suffering. In verse 5, Paul continues back in Romans chapter 2. Paul continues, but in accordance with your hardness and your impotent or unrepentance, meaning you just keep on, you just keep on, you just keep on keeping on like that. It says, but in accordance with your hardness and your impotent, unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He says, you just keep on because everything that he's pouring good is putting you more and more inexcusable. It's what he starts out with in this verse. You are inexcusable. And the more that God pours out his mercy and his long suffering, his, his kindness on you, the guiltier you become. I mean, just, it's just pouring it more out. And you're storing up. That's literally what it says. You're like, oh, you can't be either guilty or not guilty. Well, yeah, in a way, but Paul does say you're storing up treasures. It's a clear illustration that you're making things worse for yourself because you're not obedient to the things that God has shown you. Now, we're going to come back to this thing and bring it home to you just for all of us in here that are saying, boy, I know somebody needs to hear this. My husband sure needs to hear this. My wife sure needs to hear this. My parents sure need, my children sure need to hear this. Well, yeah, yeah, we need to hear this. We ain't coming to through Romans to get somebody else transformed. We're coming for personal reflection to be transformed. God's not done changing us. He says, but according to your hardness and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What is this that makes us guilty? Let's look at the way God looks at things. Jesus... When he taught the disciples how to pray, remember they said, teach us how to pray. And he, remember what he taught them? He taught them the Lord's Supper. I mean, excuse me, the Lord's Prayer. He taught them the Lord's Prayer. And we have this, this, this prayer that so many of us can, can say and memorize, but it's after that in Matthew chapter 6. It's during the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14, uh, I'm going to read this. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to just read it. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14. After, if you were to back up a little bit, you would see that there's the Lord's Prayer starting in uh, verse 9. And he says, in this manner, therefore, pray you, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And he goes through the prayer, thy kingdom come, in verse uh, 13, uh, your kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14, for if you forgive men for, meaning he's hinging this right off of the Lord's prayer, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. That ought to make everybody quake in their boots. Even people who ain't Quakers. Everybody ought to quake in their boots when they hear that because... That is something that we don't categorize ourselves as missing heaven for. 
But that is an unbelievably in-your-face statement from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's written in red if you have a red-letter Bible. And Jesus says, if you don't forgive people, I won't forgive you. And there are so many people who think, I don't commit adultery. I don't kill people. I don't steal. I don't say cuss words. I don't even drink. I don't dip, smoke, chew, or run around with girls who do. I'm a good person. But you have unforgiveness in your heart, and you ought to be quaking in your boots like a murderer. I'm sorry if you didn't come this morning to hear some truth that's in your face, but I really ain't sorry. <laughs> you know, This is the truth from the Lord, and we need to stop and say, I'm not innocent. I need to get my right, my life right with the Lord. I need, oh man, you are in big trouble because that clock's way off. It's broke. I got another hour and a half probably. Just realized that clock has not moved since I started preaching. It's 10 till 3. Um, we'll stop at 3 according to that clock. And it stopped. So, uh, uh, so, but this, this is the, we, what we need to do is we need to start looking at ourselves the way the Lord looks at us and quit looking at ourselves in comparison to somebody else because that's what we like to do. It's more convenient that way. Verse 6. It says, concerning, well, I want to reread verse 5. But in accordance to your hardness and your impotent, uh, unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. He's going to render, he's going to render to each one of us according to our deeds. And it shows one of two scenarios here. In verse 7 is one scenario, verse 8 is the second scenario. Uh, he will render to each one according to his deeds. Verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient, continuing, doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. <laughs> Boy, I underlined patient, continuance, and doing good. We're going to have to just spend some more time on that on another day. But you better be patiently continuing doing good. This is eternal life for those people. And verse, in, in verse 8 is scenario 2. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, it didn't say those who are committing adultery. It didn't say those who are killing and murdering people. It just says those who are self-seeking. Boy, we live in a self-seeking society and the Christians are not immune. The church is not immune to the self-seeking uh, philosophy that has infected this whole country and beyond. And boy, that ought to make you get honest with the Lord right there. The self-seeking and they do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Of the Jew first and also of the Greek, verse 10, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God, verse 11. No partiality. You just said first to the Jews and then the Greeks, first to the Jews and the Greeks. Yeah, absolutely. It's not partiality. And this is where we're going to start hitting home, if you don't mind. This is where the Lord's saying, you Jews who've always understood and known what God's expectations are, you better believe He's going to be dealing with you first. Meaning, it's, it's not necessarily about the order, it's, just, it's, about, it's about this priority where like those who have heard. Remember what it says at the very first verse is, you are inexcusable. And He's going to deal with you as inexcusable. Now, He's going to deal with all of us. But what Paul is doing is he is getting to, at the Jews. He's getting at the Jews. Some, pope, some people say all of chapter 1 is Paul dealing with the Gentiles. Some would say chapter 2 is him dealing with the Jews. For in verse 17, and it says, you who are a Jew. Some people say, well, in verse 1 through 16 he's dealing with like people who just think they're morally okay whether they're jews or not any church to the jews at verse 17 I'm, I'm just sharing you that there's people that have all kinds of different cut and slice of different ways about who paul's talking to but here's the thing every one of them agree that well all of it applies to all of them well therefore i'm convinced paul was talking to all of us at the same time he was talking to the Jews. He was talking to the moral person who thinks they're all right. He was talking to the straight out Gentile barbarian, crazy out there, wild person in chapter 1, and he's talking to them here. He was talking to the Jews in chapter 1, and he's talking to them here. Well, Steve, what does that have to do with us? This whole Jew-Gentile conflict that we see in the church, that existed 2,000 years ago. We are not having to deal with that. Can't there be something better that we can study? Oh, let me tell you something. We're still dealing with it. We're still dealing 
dealing with the same issues in us that, that are there, whether it's a Jew or Gentile issue, or whether it's the church or unchurched. That, that this absolutely does apply. Now we're going to continue on, but let's look at this. For there is no partiality with God. In verse 12. For as many have sinned without law, meaning those outside the law, he's getting to these Jews who say, say uh, you know, we, are, we, we really are kind of better off. Paul, he's been, they're reading this letter and they're like, ooh, Paul is really getting on them Gentiles. And Paul's saying, boy, don't you think I ain't talking to you because I am. He absolutely is. And he says this, for as many as have sinned without the law, who's that? The Gentiles. Will also perish without the law. So, <laughs> doesn't mean that they're not going to miss the same fate. That, that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we're, we're, going, to have, we're going to suffer the same fate. He's not, he's not saying the Gentiles are excused. He says that uh, if they suffer without the law, then they will, they will be judged by the law. Uh, for as many as sin w- without the law will also perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law, and he's talking about the Jews now, all you who are the Jews, you consider yourselves in the law, and have sinned in the law, will be judged by the law. And then he goes into a parenthetical statement. Matter of fact, your Bibles probably have a, a, a parenthesis starting in verse 13. Do you? If you do, verse 13. And it closes at the end of verse 15. If you're in the NIV, it might start at verse 14. And so the first thing you can do is repent for using the NIV. Just kidding. I'm just totally kidding. But no, no, I, I, I agree actually with the, the King James. Again, these parentheses are not in the original Greek. But the parenthetical statement is. So just like commas and periods and quotations and that stuff, it's appropriate that in our English language we apply, apply the punctuation and we should apply the punctuation here. If, if parentheses fall in the punctuation category, I'll let you smart people tell me later. But for now, let's just go with the fact that there's a parenthetical statement from verse 13 to verse 15, which means that there's a statement that could be had just from saying verse 12 and verse 16. Now, it might be hard for you in your Bibles to read verse 12 and then skip these verses and start at verse 16. So I'm going to ask you to follow along on your screen because uh, due to the miracle that is technology, Aaron Bob will make us go straight from 12 to verse 16. All right, in verse 12 it says, For as many have, as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. As many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Well, that's a statement in and of itself, is it not? It's a statement where he says, We are not going to be without excuse. God is going to judge us. He's going to judge us those who are in the law, the Jews, or the Gentiles. He's going to judge us both, and we're both going to be accountable. And so we need to quit doing what the Jews did and looking at other people. You're like, I'm not doing that, Steve. That's not my thing. Oh, hold on. But let's go ahead and read what Paul does say in his parentheses to drill down a little bit further in verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness in between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. All Paul is saying, you think that you got an advantage because you are a Jew when you can look around and you can see there are some people in your very congregation, some people who are Gentiles who have not been circumcised, who are not obeying the law, not doing all these things that you think make you right with God, and what are they doing? They're honoring God. We've seen Gentiles do that from, from th- throughout the history of the Israelites. Some of them coming out and, and being com- c- c- converting completely to Judaism. Some of them not. We see people in the New Testament who the, Jesus says, man, I ain't never seen no faith like I see in you. He, talk, he talks about that to at least a couple of people who weren't even Jews. And some people that knew and loved the Lord. That We find examples of that in New Testament. And Paul is saying, it's about who, what's going on in the heart that you obey the Lord or not. You respond to your Creator as we talked about in chapter 1. You acknowledge that there's a Creator God and you respond to Him accordingly and you love Him. It's not about the law that you think that you have going your way. Now what in the world does that have to do with us, Steve? 
Let's turn to Acts chapter 15. Okay. Acts chapter 15. And we're going to bring this home. Acts chapter 15. Paul, the apostle, has been going around doing what the Lord called him to do. And we pick up in Acts chapter 15, and we see in verse 1 that certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, where do they come down for? If you back up to Acts chapter 14, you see in verse 26, from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to. So, these certain men from verse 1, these certain men came down from Judea. Judea is where Jerusalem is. It's where the Jews are from. Uh, uh, these certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. They had come down from Judea to come to Antioch. And it wasn't just Antioch. This was happening. Paul is fighting this on almost every epistle he writes. They come down and saying, you Gentiles... We understand that, that you accept that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So do we. There were some Jews who accepted that. So do we. We accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And we will now let you into our exclusive club and our exclusive deal we got going with God. You get to come in. But you got to obey the law of Moses. You've got to be circumcised because circumcision was a mark of a Jew. That was not something that just anybody did. And so he says, if you want to be, you got to do the whole thing. You got to be you know, do this system that we've got going on. You've got to conform just like we've had to conform. You've got to do this. And Paul's like, no, 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 Buffalo. That is not the way this thing works. That's not what the gospel message is about. This gospel message is that, that the law was there to show us that we're broke. And so some of this, this areas and aspects of the law were symbolic leading up to a particular time and place where now God has fulfilled these things and we don't have to do some of these things. Now, the laws that reflect the character of God and the behavior that we should have to God and one another, those things have not changed. They're obvious. So the circumcision, he says, that what they're doing is they're trying to put them in some kind of system and Paul says, no, that's not the way it works. So therefore, Paul and Barnabas, in verse 2, had no small dissension. That means they had a big dissension. That means they were very much disagreeing with them. And had no small dissension and dispute with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So here we have this big conflict in the early church. And it is, we want, the, there was many people coming, Jews, saying, these Gentiles that we're letting come into this whole Christianity thing, this relationship with God, they need to obey the law. They need to be circumcised. They need to do all these things. And Paul says, no, that's not right. So they go and they say, let's get this worked out with Christian headquarters, which is basically, let's go to Jerusalem and let's talk to the apostles there and let's get this worked out. So, being sent on their way, verse 3, by the church, they passed through uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Verse 4, and when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and, and they reported all things that God had done with them. And so Paul and Barnabas are just telling the church, man, oh, God is good. Look what all he's been doing as we've been out on our missionary journey, just like the Lord sent us out to go do this. Oh, it's just great things are happening. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, and these were Pharisees who were Christians, they believed in God and they believed in Jesus as the Messiah, rose up and saying, oh, 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 yeah, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So here comes Paul and Barnabas, and he declares all the good things that the Lord has done among the Gentiles. He talks about how, how they've received the gift of the Spirit. They've, they've been, they prophesy, they speak in tongues. Man, these people are sold out for God. These great things are happening. And, uh, and and so it's clear that God is moving on them in their Gentile state without them having become Jews. And so some of these say, oh, they need to go ahead and do the whole thing, keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, meaning not a little bit dispute, but a lot of dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, 
You know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the, gener- the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. I like the way, the, that, uh, the way uh, Peter says, uh, let me throw my resume out there for you. You know God gave me a, a kind of inside track on the Gentiles, right? I was called to do this thing. Paul also called to the Gentiles. Peter was called also. And so Paul, Peter says, hey, I got a say in this because of the role that God put me in. And he says this. Verse 8, so God, who knows the heart, uh, acknowledges them, talking about the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And made no distinction between us and them, meaning God is not a respectful person, God is not showing favorites, as, as uh, Paul said. Now therefore, why, uh, purifying their hearts by faith, now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now I want us to stop right there. And I want us to get real for a minute. Because as we've been looking through this, we probably could very easily say, yep, yeah, that applies to some people, not me. I wish you'd get something that applies to me so that I have something for this week to work on. Okay, here's where it applies to you. This state of the Jews and this mentality and this condition of the Jews is the condition that I see so often, very often, quite often in the church community those who have been churched see the jews had been aware of god their whole life they've been aware of the law of god their whole life they've been aware their whole life of what god expects and what god demands and what god wants and and they've been we've been aware of that they've been aware of that their whole life and they have this tendency to look down as they look around at people who walk around in this world just full of violence and man like they don't even know who god is that is still the way that the churched people today too often, so often, quite often look at the people that they come in contact with, even just like the new, the Jews were looking at the new Christian converts that way. I've seen church people look at the new believers that way. See, the, 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 the church people, and, and, and I'm going to use, for example, like my kids. My kids have been raised in church. So they're kind of like the Jews in this illustration here. My kids have been raised in church, and so they've kind of always known who God is. They kind of always know the rules. You know, you don't smoke, you don't cuss, you don't do all these things. And as soon as they get into their own uh, relationship with God, now they are serving just like these Jews had been converted. Maybe they are now Christians on their own, right? And they began to look at other new people who are coming in, like the Jews looked at the Gentiles. They look at those people and say, Oh my gosh, look at them. They dip, smoke, cuss, chew, and all these kinds of things. They need to get their life right. They need to obey the law. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that. And they start hanging over them the law just like the Jews hung over the Gentiles. Now I want you to know it's a reality. It is a reality. And they become modern day Jews who try to put new converts under the law. And they, instead of, of, of understanding that they themselves are guilty, so oftentimes the church community, people who have been raised in church, are just as guilty of these things. They are quick to look and see all that somebody else is not doing. And they say, look, they need to be going to church every time the door is open. They need to quit cussing. They still cuss sometimes. And they need to be doing this. Look, they're drinking and they're smoking and they're doing these things. And they're laying down the law for them. And they are modern day Jews looking down the nose at these Gentiles. That is not the way that we're supposed to behave. And I see it. I see it. It's a reality. This absolutely applies today. There are too many of the church people who are modern day Jews. Who are looking to put other people under bondage. When they themselves are breaking these very laws. Oh no, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't cuss. Okay, don't you gossip out of the same mouth that, that, that you ain't cussing out of? Yeah. <laughs> ain't you withholding love to the same, uh, just out of the same heart that you're supposed to be loving people with? Uh, don't you, don't you e- even do these things, be angry with your brother without cause? Just like those people over there who are killing people. The Lord's seeing it all the same. And instead... <laughs> We are putting other people under bondage. We have this issue where we don't see our own faults. 
We can't imagine ourselves as being either the Gentile or those Jews that were just as bad as them. You know what we've done? Now we've made ourselves Jews in the second person. <laughs> no, you know, that's, what, that's kind of what we've done. You know what? This, do you know where, where we're going in this? We're going to see in, in, in chapter 3 that, that Paul says that all are guilty before the, before the Lord. And then he goes on to, to lay out things that, that illustrate this, uh, this, this state that we, we are in where we're like, man, I, I, I want to do the right things and I end up doing the wrong things. He starts showing the, 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 the fallibility of man and we how we can't please God and these things. And he paints this illustration. And if we were to be honest, we would see that we need to be set free from this, this horrible bondage that we're in. And that's what Paul says. Where we're going, we can't get to. You're going to miss it if we don't right now start taking what Paul has been setting up and saying, you need to start turning that finger inward. And where are we on that? Really? Where are we on that? Are we really turning the finger inward? Are we really being responsible and realizing that we are the one that needs to change? We are the ones who need to repent. Where are you at today on that? Or have you been listening to the sermon saying, ooh, somebody's guilty, but it sure ain't me. Again, we find the biggest obstacle to repentance is our inability to see our own weakness and our own sin. And I pray that this morning that we can make a change. We need to be prepared for where God has taken us, the transformation He wants to make in us, the change He wants to make in us can only be done when we start being humble and admit that we need to change. Let us pray.